Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, welcome, Governor. Thank and thank you. you very much for making your time available to the committee. Could you explain for the committee how the most recent budget has changed the central bank's inflationary outlooks? Uh, the recent budget really has had uh, very little effect on, um, on our inflation forecasts. Uh, most of the improvement in the, uh, the budget, the, the revenue was taken through to the bottom line, not all of it, but um, most of it, and I think that was appropriate. So the current uh, setting of fiscal policy is not um, impacting uh, noticeably on monetary policy. The, the issue that we are focused on, and this is something over time, is the structural budget position, which uh, um, we've, as a country, we've benefited very, uh, over a long period of time, from having a very sound medium-term structural budget position. That gives us flexibility to respond to shocks. We've got more work to do to get the budget into a structurally strong position. But at the moment, uh, it's not affecting interest rate policy at all. So would you characterise that as a missed opportunity to put downward pressure on inflation I'm not interest going rates? to um, comment on kind of the, the um, current budget. The, 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 the best thing I think we can do to to help uh, get inflation back down is to address the supply side. It's, the, you know, the, the pickup in inflation, at least half is due to supply side problems and the other half is um, due to very strong growth in aggregate demand, broadly speaking. And if we can do something on energy and rents next year, inflation will come down quickly. And managing aggregate demand isn't going to really change the dynamics there on energy and rents, is it? It's, it's fixing the supply side issues. Just focusing on uh, one of those three elements, the yep. housing part of your comments, um, how realistic is it that we might see uh, downward uh, pressure on rents over the short or medium term? Well, in the short term, it's very hard because um, it takes a while to build houses and apartments, but you know, the central bank always has a medium term horizon. So I'm thinking kind of the next two to three years, we'll have less pressure on rents and upward pressure on housing prices if we can add to the housing stock. And it's not something any... that's going to work in the next six months, so it's not a, problem, it's not a solution to the current problem, but uh, the high inflation, I think, is going to be with us for a number of years. So looking out over those two years, or two or three years, increasing the supply of housing will help. Um, do you consider that expanding budget deficits over the medium term is expansionary fiscal policy? Uh, in general, yes. If you're, if you're running larger budget deficits as a share of the economy, that uh, is um, expansionary fiscal policy. But how immaterial it is on the setting of interest rates, it really depends upon the scale of the expansion of fiscal policy. But the, the issue, as I said before, is um, getting the, the medium term budget back into, into um, good shape. And as I said to the House Economics Committee uh, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the public understandably want all these services provided or funded by the government. Aged care, education, disability care, it's kind of things that the public want. Uh, and if the public want those and the government wants to provide them, then we need to find a way of paying for them. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the fiscal, um, the main fiscal um, issue confronting the nation, how to pay for all those goods and services that the public want the government to provide for us. Mm. So when we look at the, um, the budget deficits over the medium term, is that helping the inflationary task or hindering the inflationary task? Uh, I, I would say it's, it's broadly neutral. Because the swings in the budget deficit of the share of GDP are not that large in the in the out years, it's just persistent budget deficits. That's assuming, and the economy doesn't um, uh, weaken a lot. If we all, if it weakened a lot, then the budget deficit would go up even more. But assuming the economy goes along the central track that we're forecasting, then we're going to see persistent budget deficits of a few percentage points of GDP and over time, I think it would be better if we get back into a more balanced position. It's not a first, I don't want to give you the impression it's a first order issue affecting the setting of monetary policy. It's one of those um, background good housekeeping things that it's good to have done 
so that uh, fiscal policy has the ability to respond in the future when we get hit by shocks. And we can only have that ability to respond as we did in the global financial crisis and in the pandemic if the structural position is good. I do want to come to the structural the position that's my focus, sorry. I do want to come to yeah. the risk or propensity for future shocks. Yeah. You have mentioned that uh, in your most recent speech, but in some other documents as well. But just going back to Senator McKim's uh, question, in response to Senator McKim, you said the Australian recovery had uh, responded more quickly than expected. Can you just explain for the committee uh, what were the features that allowed the economy to respond more quickly following um, the pandemic? Yeah. Um, you know, Australia was one of the first countries to get back to the pre-pandemic pre level of output, and now we're considerably above the pre-pandemic level. In the UK, for example, uh, the central forecast of the government, the central bank, is that they will not be back to pre-pandemic levels of output until the end of 24, by which time we'll be 6 or 7% above um, where we were before. Uh, we've got um, the unemployment rate, the lowest in 50 years. We've got to go back to 1974 to have a lower unemployment rate. So the economy has bounced back quickly and we're as close to full employment as we've been in 50 years. The employment to population ratio in Australia is the highest it's ever been. In other words, more Australians as a share of the population have a job today than ever before in our history. You know, that's, that's pretty impressive. So that's, not many countries in the world are in that position. So Australia, well, we've got some issues, I think it is in, it is a very strong position globally. How do we get there? A, a, three things have helped. The, uh, the way the, the governments around the country managed the pandemic helped. Um, we didn't have the terrible health, health outcomes they had in the United Kingdom and uh, the United States, and that has meant that people are prepared to participate in the labour market. So that, that has helped. Uh, the, the second thing is the insurance policy that the Reserve Bank and the government took out worked. In retrospect, I, as I said before, I think we probably over-insured. We provided too much insurance, but that's the nature of insurance. Is that you insure against a really bad thing, it doesn't happen, and you think, well, wish I'd taken out a bit less insurance. So that insurance involved very low interest rates and all the government spending. That created a lot of demand in the economy. And so people, because the health situation's okay, people have been prepared to spend because they've had the income. So that the nature of the insurance policy during the pandemic has helped. And the third thing uh, that's helping is that our national income is being boosted by high commodity prices once again. I recall giving speeches more than a decade ago in the iron ore boom saying our terms of trade, so export prices relative to import prices, were the highest since the gold rushes of the 1850s. And this was a unique period in our history and we'd never see anything like it again. Well, here we are in 2022, the highest terms of trade ever. So national income is being boosted, the insurance policy during the pandemic helped, and the health response worked. If you put all that together, we're in, we're in an enviable position relative to most other countries around the world. I suppose the question that is top yep. of mind for yep. many uh, people, Governor, is um, why couldn't or why didn't the RBA see such a quick positive rebound out of the, the pandemic. I mean, the use of the word insurance policy, yep. I'm happy to be corrected. Yep. The use of the word insurance policy is one of, of, of more recent times. Had the insurance policy reference been used during the pandemic, it might have given Australians a better understanding of some of that future risk that they've now seen in terms of uh, escalating interest rates. Yeah. So why, why was it not foreseen by the RBA? Because it s makes perfect sense in hindsight, yeah. but your job is to see with much greater clarity than anyone else in the country, you know, the various strengths and weaknesses in the economy. So I'm a little bit confused why, 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 why such the strong positive outcome was not foreseen. Yeah, yeah well, it's a good question. and. Um, now, remember kind of in um, the middle of last year, or running through to October, we had the Delta outbreak. And um, you know, in Western Australia it was different, but in, you know, in Sydney we couldn't move 
five kilometres from our house. Uh, people couldn't move out of their local government area, even for work, without getting a test. And in Melbourne, you know, they were locked down. So this was, that was right up until um, October, and it wasn't until probably November that we were getting back to freedom. So we kept on thinking, well, it's possible that growth could come back, but then we kept on getting locked down again, and there'd be more outbreaks. And it, so by late um, last year, I was thinking, well, maybe um, we, we'd get through this without further lockdowns. And then um, at, at around Christmas time last year, remember, we had the Omicron outbreak. And we were thinking, well, is this going to be like Delta? We didn't, you know, we're not experts on the health situation. So we were worried that, well, this could be a rerun of Delta with lockdowns, restrictions on travel, and the economy being shut down again. And once it became clear, that um, Omicron was not like Delta. We got through that okay, and um, wage growth was picking up. We decided to move, but every time we thought things could be coming back, we got another outbreak, and we got more lockdowns. And you know, it was, we, when is this going to end? We didn't know. Um, it's not our kind of core competency, but we kept on getting more shocks and we wanted to keep the insurance going while ever that was happening. Except it would have been better if um, we'd understood the resilience and that Omicron wasn't going to be like Delta and we'd come through that okay. Well, actually, that's a very important point. Yeah. If you had better understood the resilience of the economy um, that was sort of under, that was underpinning, un under, uh, yeah. uh, underpinning sitting beneath the various um, waves of the of the of the pandemic, so again, I'm, I'm not quite yeah. convinced why you didn't see the underlying strength. Well, we were, were conscious that um, spending had been um, more resilient, but we kept on getting hit off the kind of the recovery path by um, outbreaks, and we were quite concerned that um, having come out of um, Delta, and that was pretty. Mm. Disruptive in um, along the eastern um, seaboard. Yes, yeah. It was very disruptive, and then we were getting another variant. And when Omicron first came, people said, "Well, this could be Delta all over again. Mm. We could be all locked down again in January and February, Je December, January, February." I thought, "Well, if that's the case, um, we, the government can't keep um, uh, the wage subsidy going forever, and neither should it." So somehow the fiscal side had to be wound back at some point, mm. was responsible to do that. But um, if Omicron had been like Delta and the government couldn't keep the fiscal response going, then we had to keep interest rates low. So I think if we'd known, well, clearly if we'd known that Omicron was not going to be like Delta and there weren't going to be lockdowns and people could go about their lives pretty quickly, then we would have, um, Consider a different path, but we didn't know that. Uh, that's the, I think that's the fundamental. We, you know, Delta was pretty was was shocking for the community. Yes, look, I, I'd like, I, I, accept, I accept the point. The yeah. further we move away from yeah. uh, the pandemic, the yeah. harder it is for people to perhaps appreciate you know what was actually happening at the time. Mm. I accept that. Thanks. Um, Thanks. I'm going to be yeah. I called yeah, you yeah, a no, last no, question. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll just ask a couple. I have others, of course. Clarifying of course, questions. Yeah. And I'll come to you, no, Senator Kenman.